God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the I like the way you just slowed that down, too. That cannot be. Sing it with me in the name of Jesus. Enemies defeated. And we will shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. Say God is fighting for us. God is fighting for us. Jesus, we're on the winning side. We worship you now. Yes, Lord. Yeah. 
of praise. Praise the one who set me free. Yeah. Hallelujah, which means praise his name, praise the Lord. And this next song that we're going to sing is his praise will ever be on my lips, which basically means I get to choose to praise God with the words that come out of my mouth. And I think it's easy to enter an environment like this, go to church or go to God and give him our laundry list of, of complaints to show God how big our trial is, to show God how big our situation and circumstance is, rather than acknowledge the fact that he's bigger than it. And it made me think of Acts chapter 16. Paul in the Bible found himself in a situation where he was on his way to pray and there was a girl following him. She was demon possessed. Paul got fed up and he, and, he, and he told that demon to flee and it did. But this girl was a fortune teller and her owners made money off of her. So they got mad and they threw, they beat up Paul and Silas, they threw him into the jail. And Paul and Silas had every reason to complain. God, I was just trying to do your work. Why is my life like this? Why did you put me in this cold jail? Why did you put these chains around my feet when I was just trying to do your work? But rather than complain, the Bible says Paul and Silas began to sing. Paul and Silas began to pray. And the moment that happened, a miracle took place. But not just for them, for every single person that was in that jail. What am I saying? Praise and thanksgiving is the key to the miracle that you're asking for in your life. So yeah, I got a reason to complain. Yeah, I got a laundry list of things to complain. But I, I can also sit and say, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. God, thank you for putting breath in my lungs. God, thank you for the fact that I could be here on a Wednesday night and lift up my hands and praise and worship you freely. God, thank you. So you might be in here and you need a miracle in your life. This is our miracle moment. We believe not only when two or three are gathered, God is there in the midst, but where God is, a miracle can take place. For you, for you. So if that's you, for a second with every eye closed, would you raise your hand in the air if you're in need of a miracle in your life? You need God to move on your behalf. Holy Spirit, Father, you see every single hand that is raised in this place, God, you see every single person that's raising their hands online or at their house, Lord God. And we believe that your presence is with us. It's among us. It's around us. It's upon us, Lord God. And so we pray right now for every single situation that people are going through, God. I pray that you begin to intervene. I pray that your kairos begins to intervene. A divine intervention happens for every single person in this place. But God, as we're in the middle of our trial, as we're in the middle of our circumstance, would you help us have a perspective of praise, a perspective of thanksgiving that though my life isn't how I want it to be, you are with me in it, and because of that, it's good. So we lift up our needs, our wants, and our worries to you, and we ask for you to have your way. We love you, and your praise will ever be, ever be on our lips. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Be on my lips 
with praise and thanksgiving that is your will for us and so we say thank you not just for what you've done but thank you for who you've been to us we give you all the praise you all the glory and you all the honor because you're worth it in Jesus name amen and amen can we give God some praise just one more time it's good to be in the house of God on a Wednesday night are y'all glad to be here man God is so good hey before you take a seat, turn to somebody next to you, say hello, introduce yourself. If you're watching online, we'd love to know where our ALFC family is tuning in online. So go ahead, put it in the chat. We're so glad you chose to join us on this Wednesday night. It's gonna be so good. And if it is your first time here, we wanna say welcome. Welcome to the family. After church, you can go to our welcome counter to the right or to the left of you, and we'd love to give you a gift and just say thank you for joining us tonight. So can we give a hand clap to all of our first time guests tonight? So grateful that you're here. Hey, we just have one announcement. Uh, this upcoming Saturday, we have what is called Family and Family, and we're trying to feed up to 3,000 families with a Thanksgiving dinner. And so we need some help, some volunteers. We would love to have you join us. So if you'd like to volunteer this Saturday, join the family and really see God change and transform lives through us giving and serving, all you have to do is head to alsc.faith, go to the events tab, and you'll be able to serve there, sign up to serve. We can't wait to see you guys this Saturday and see all that God does through this church on Saturday morning. So would you go ahead and prepare your hearts right now for our generosity moment? Hey family, it's that special time of year. It's, right now it's our generosity moment, but we always like to, as we go into the fall season and the Christmas season, we do something special as a church. We've done it for years. It's what we call our family to family. It's where we become the hands and feet to Jesus, to those in need. You know, every single year, whether it be Thanksgiving or Christmas, we have families that are not able to have a meal over the Thanksgiving table to be able to break bread together because financially it's too difficult or during Christmas, we have kids that are in need. Maybe they're from low income families and those kids are not gonna get some presents this year. And for us, it's a way that our church could be able to supply a hot meal on Thanksgiving and also some presents for their kids on Christmas so that they don't feel excluded. But also we do it on behalf of the love of God, on behalf of the grace of Jesus in our life. So like we do every single year, this is the season where all of us can reach in and give something. We always say it'd be great if someone can give starting at $25, but you know what? Because of the economy and because of inflation, our food cost has become so much this year and the past two years that our budget has increased by double just to be able to reach those that we normally reach. And so this year, as we go into our family to family giving, it, whether you're in service, you're gonna see some yellow envelopes or you could go to our website and in giving, you can click family to family. And here's the thing, during Thanksgiving and also Christmas, all of those proceeds are gonna go to give a hot meal to a family and also presents to kids that are in need. It's our way that we as a church surround our community, love our community and share the gospel of Jesus Christ by meeting uh, just necessary needs. So family, if you'd like to help us out today, just know that whether you visit our website or you grab a yellow envelope, you are helping some people out who are in low income needs. And as a church, we always hear of the incredible fruit, lives that are changed just because someone got something as simple as a hot meal on Thanksgiving. But something that's gonna happen for you and I on Thanksgiving day may not happen to others if we don't circle around them and share the love of God. 
In addition, it's our normal generosity moment. So if you would like to give today, uh, we thank you so much for partnering with us in the ministry and the work of God. And you can easily do so the same way. You can download an app called PushPay, or you can download and go to our website, click your campus, whether it's online, Rancho, or Pomona. And however you do give today, it's not about how much you give, it's about the heart behind it. So thank you for partnering with us today as you give. God bless you. We're always so proud of our congregation, how generous we are, especially uh, around the holidays. And uh, I really encourage you, um, even if you can't spend long, just go by uh, the outreach center and just see the smiles on people's faces. See the, the tears that they cry. See the long lines of people that line up. Just kind of during this month that we've been preaching on Thanksgiving, it just allows us to be really, really thankful uh, that we don't have to be in that line. I, I don't know if that makes sense. And that if you're in the line, that's okay. But you know what? I'm just, we're just grateful and be a great way for you to connect, especially with young people, because our young people uh, have lived in comfortability, and it's a great way to begin to shape and mold their heart when you begin to tell them, we are helping to feed people at Thanksgiving, so you're going to work side by side with me, and you're going to put your little hand on that box, and we're going to put it in the car together, and you're going to wave, God bless you, happy Thanksgiving. It'll, it'll just be monumental in their heart, and that's what it's really all about. Well, uh, and again, uh, I, I, I brought it somewhere. We have our, mine and Cindy's gift, yes, mine and Cindy's gift for uh, the Thanksgiving, because... We wanted to make sure that we, uh, we gave toward that. Um, so she sent me here with uh, her gift. She's on a mission today, one of those days where women are cleaning out the garage. She cannot be disturbed. I keep 100 feet away from her. Uh, do you need some water? Do you need? Okay, I'm going to church. God bless you. So she's doing a great job in doing that. But our friend is with us tonight, and he's more than a friend. He's a hero. Um, he's... Uh, a matriarch to us, he's a, a board member, he's a counselor, and these are not just flippant, dramatic words of how he shaped and impact uh, the life, the vision, and the history of Abundant Living Family Church. Uh, I, I've never said this, but um, it was somewhere, we're 28 years old, we probably were uh, not more than um, 24 uh, four years old, somewhere around maybe, um, you know, 24 years ago. Uh, I knew there would be a ceiling on my leadership based upon the experience that I had come from. Down deep in here, I felt that God wanted to do something bigger in the church expression of how he wanted to build abundant living. And I knew the people that I surrounded myself with would make the vast difference if I only hung around the people that I had been with that make me comfortable where I'd come from, then I would probably mimic and mirror that. But if I sensed that God wanted something different, I would have to swim in bigger waters with bigger fish. And um, that's when God led us uh, to come to the first time in Glendora to hear. Um, now, I had already listened to John Maxwell, so I was a big leadership fan of John Maxwell. But John had moved on from being a pastor, and he, he, his stuff's great. He speaks to the business world. Um, but I wanted to hear from a pastor. Talk to me about leadership and the, uh, the difficulties that a pastor goes through and visitors and discipleship and salvations and growing a staff. And J Pastor Gerald just hit that spot. And uh, like a puppy dog, I've never lost his leg, loved on him, followed him wherever he's gone. And uh, he's just uh, been a great friend. We've adopted him uh, as, um, you know, one of our quote, quote unquote advisors and counselors. And um, you're going to be blessed. He comes twice a year. and We're always grateful to do that. Uh, but he has a, he's an amazing writer and he wrote this book, which uh, I, I really want everyone to get. So there's just a, a limited amount tonight. Uh, and you could, we'll sell out of them tonight, and then we can order them. He said they'll ship them out tomorrow. It's an amazing book about what's going on today. It's called Tough Times. Really dealing with how to survive, how to overcome, and have a mentality. In Hebrews 11 chapter, everybody in the hall of faith went through tough times. And if you want your faith to triumph, you're going to have to learn how to push through tough times. 
One of my, there, there's uh, seven chapters here that deal with uh, tough places, tough times, tough odds, tough jobs, tough principles, uh, tough but tender. But this one that I've heard a little bit of him preach on, which um, we have about 900 people once a week that log on to our prayer service on Friday night. This one's called Tough Prayers. And uh, we've heard him talk a little bit about this. Uh, the, the Prayer Warriors, especially you 900, this would be a book just to get just for that chapter on tough prayers. So I, I just want to encourage you tonight. Um, if you want to know oftentimes who the person is, read their books. Uh, you really uh, want to be mentored, and you can't be mentored by going, to, by going to lunch or having coffee with them. Let the book mentor him. His heart is in this book, and you will extremely be blessed. But I'm going to ask that you stand on your feet and welcome our pastor friend, Gerald Brooks, as he preaches the gospel to you now. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here. Lord, I'm dependent on you because I don't know the people in this room. I don't know anything about the people in this room, but you know everything about the people in this room. And Lord, right now, I pray that you would minister according to your knowledge and insight, not according to mine. You know the uniquenesses, you know the trials, you know the tribulations, you know the great times, you know the times that are joyous to them, but you know right where they're at. So today, Lord, I ask that you would speak to them, minister to them, but above all, when it's all said and done, help us to be more like Jesus than ever before. That is our prayer in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And we all agree together saying... Amen. Well, you can be seated. Uh, before I jump into the lesson, it's, it's something that I just want to say. You folks don't know me, uh, but anyone who does knows I get to speak at the greatest churches and most everyone that someone would consider pretty dynamic, they're friends of mine. And it's important for me to say how much I love Diego and how much I believe in Adam and Nathan. Now, I want to give a caveat to that, and the caveat is this. A lot of people like you when they're in front of you. They're your friend when they are right there. But you need to understand something. I believe in Diego, Adam, and Nathan. Not when I'm here, but when I'm not here. I value them. I value their ministry. And I just say that to you because for anyone who wants to search me, I will say that my voice is a voice that you need to hear. That family is doing a great job. This evening, uh, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about it's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, neither to look thereon. If you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, said three things would happen before this world ended. Three things. The first thing he mentioned was in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. He says, as this world begins to end, there's going to be more problems and less faith. More problems and less faith. Because it says in there, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on this earth? Now, I have to be honest with you. That verse bothered me because I saw it as impossible. How in the world could we even raise the question that if Jesus came back, that he wouldn't find faith on this earth? I mean, just think of all the churches that you drive by to get to this one. Think of all the podcasts. Think of all the streaming platforms. 
Think of all of the books that are out there on Christ. It has to be that there would be faith in this earth. There's no way that there wouldn't be faith in this earth. But the simple fact of the matter is over the last 27 months, for the very first time, I saw it. I saw how it could possibly come to pass that the question could be rise, that that whether there would be faith on this earth. And it was very simple. For the first time, I saw if you take a problem and you elevate that problem and you talk about that problem and you put that problem on every newscast, you put that problem on every text stream, you put that problem on every streaming platform, you put that problem in every email and you magnify that problem, you talk about that problem and you enlarge that problem Problem, that you will begin to get people who are so focused on a problem that they will lose sight of their faith. And I saw it for the first time. I saw that there is a conditioning response that will get people who believe to quit believing, who will get people who used to go to church will no longer go to church. People who used to be close to God are no longer close to God. And I saw for the very first time that if you take a problem and you make it so big and you get everyone talking about it, you get everyone centered on it, you get everyone focused on it, that people will let the elevation of a problem displace their faith. So Jesus said that in these last days, problems will get bigger and faith will get smaller. That there will be more problems and there will be less faith. But then on the other hand, he said a second thing would happen. He said that anger would increase, and he said that love will decrease. Anger will increase, and love will decrease. He says in Matthew 24 and verse 12, he says that the love of many will begin to grow cold. He says people that used to love will no longer love. People who used to be kind will no longer be kind. People who used to help will no longer help. People who used to serve will no longer serve. He said people that used to be the ones that would give to a Thanksgiving opportunity, they'll no longer give to that. And he said what will happen is anger will increase and love will decrease. And right now in our society we're seeing it. See, I've done what I do at my church for 40 years. I stand at the back door of my church. And if you went back 15 years ago, something changed. See, 15 years ago, if I had someone visit our church, I would stand at the back, they'd come by and they'd say, hey, pastor, we're visiting today. We'd just like to take a few moments to talk to you. And do you know what they would do? They would ask me about our tenets of faith. Do we believe that Jesus is the son of God? Do we believe in the virgin birth? Do we believe in the Holy Spirit? Do we believe in the inerrancy of the word of God? Do we believe? And they would ask me. In 15 years, not one person has asked me about our tenets of faith. You know what they've asked me about? They've asked me about my opinions. What do you think about this? What do you feel about this? And what are you saying about this? And what are you saying about that? And then one day I was driving home and it finally hit me what was going on. That if I would be mad at what people were mad at, they would come to my church. But if I wouldn't be mad at what they're mad at, they wouldn't come to my church. And if I would be as mad as they are at what they're mad about, they would come to our church. But if they could find another church that would be mad about that, they were going to be out the doors. And I saw for the first time, it was no longer based on any kind of loving relationship. It was now based on anger. It was now based on us being mad. And one of the saddest things is, is that church has become a center of mad instead of love. And people sit there and they say, hey, if you'll be mad at this, if you'll speak at this, if you'll say this, then I'll come. So Jesus said, as this world begins to end, you will see three things happen. The first one is problems are going to increase and faith is going to decrease. 
The third one is, is that you are, or the second one is, you are going to see anger increase and you're going to see love decrease. But the third one, in Matthew 24 and verse 7, he says that there will be more tragedies and less hope. That you'll turn on the TV and you'll ask yourself, how many more school shootings can we live through? How can this keep happening? How many more famines can there be? How many more brutal conflicts can occur over the world? And he said that you'll start noticing tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And then he said what will happen is people will lose hope. So he said, three things are going to happen. Problems are going to increase. Faith is going to decrease. Anger is going to increase. And love is going to decrease. Tragedies are going to increase. And hope is going to decrease. Now, I don't know how it looks in Rancho Cucamonga, but at least in the Dallas, Texas area, if we're not on the road to the end of this world, we found the on-ramp to get there. Because all three of those things are happening at a level that I've never seen before. I've never seen before. In Revelation chapter 5, we are given this dramatic scene. This dramatic scene would look like someone down in Burbank and Hollywood had gotten together and storyboarded. It is so dramatic. It's one of the most dramatic passages in all of Scripture. You look at it and you think, my goodness, this is made for TV moment. But it's John, the last of the apostles. Everyone else has been martyred. Everyone else has been killed. He's the last one. And in Revelation chapter 5, he begins to see into heaven. And it says this in there. You've got this scene, and what you see is you see the throne room of God. And you see God seated on the throne. You see this gigantic throne room. You see God seated on the throne, but there's this aerial display going on, and it's just going on on top, and it's going back and forth, and it's an angel beginning to fly, and this angel begins to ask a question. Who is worthy? Who is worthy? Who is worthy? And then simultaneously, the elders, those that have preceded us in faith, begin to take off their crown. It's all their natural achievements. And in heaven, none of your natural achievements mean anything. So they take them off and they begin to lay them at the foot of the throne saying, God, we worship you. These are nothing in comparison. In the middle of that, worship is just exploding. But over to the side, John's watching this, and he's crying uncontrollably. He's in tears. He can't help himself. Tears are beginning to come out of him. He is crying, and he cannot stop it. So what in the world is going on? What is it in this throne room that is creating this vivid moment? You see God as he's sitting there. You see the angel. You begin to see the elders. You hear the worship. You see John crying. What is it that's going on? Well, if you do what I do for a living, one of the things you know is that God doesn't repeat himself unless he's creating emphasis. And what you find in Revelation 5 is this, that eight times in nine verses, the scroll is mentioned. The scroll is mentioned. See, in that scene of God sitting on the throne, it's not like he's sort of all the way back. It's like he's on the edge of his seat, and and in his right hand is the scroll. And he seems to be clutching it, and he seems to be reaching out. And so the elders are watching it. The angel is asking about it. The songs are declaring it. And it's all a question. The scroll. Now, I can't think of another place in the Bible than in such a short passage that one thing is mentioned repeatedly. The scroll. The scroll. The scroll. The scroll. The scroll. Eight times And nine verses, the scroll. 
And it just keeps being repeated. So what is this? What is this scroll that heaven is stopping to observe? What is it that God's holding? What is it that the angel's saying, who can open it? What is it that the elders are noticing? And why in the world would it cause John to cry? What's the scroll? Well, in simple terms, to understand the scroll, you've got to go back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, it talks about the creation of this world as we know it. And when it comes to the creation of this world as we know it, it says that God began to create the seas. And he said it was good. And when God says something's good, it's good. And and he began to create the land. And he said it was good. He began to create the birds. And he said it was good. He began to create the sea. And he said it was good. He began to create the morning and the evening. And it said that it was good. It goes through all these things. But all of those things are saying God created this world. And it was created good. There were no earthquakes, there were no famines, there were no wildfires, there were no um, oceans that got out, there were no floods. It was created good. It was in perfect order, in perfect balance, and it was perfect. And when God created it, he was the creator of everything. Psalm 24 and verse 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 26 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereon. And see what he's holding in his hand is what we would call in our terminology the title deed to the earth. He's holding the title deed. Now some of you know what a title deed is. See, some of you have bought a home. And when you buy a home, you go into a closing office. And when you go into that closing office, here's what happens. They give you a set of documents to sign. But usually the last one that you sign is the title to the home. It says that you own it. Some of you have bought a car. When you go into the dealership, they take you into a back office and they try to upsell you. They try to give you all of these things. But usually they get down to signing the documents and you're going to sign the title to that car. It means you own it. So what God did was he created this world. And when he created this world, he created it good. He created it perfect. And he had the title deed. This belongs to me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But see, in Genesis chapter 2, something happened. God created this perfect world, but then he said, I want somebody to share this world. And he took and he took the dust of the ground and he began to breathe into it. And there became a living soul, Adam. And what happened in Genesis chapter 2 is this. He created Adam, and he began to show him, and he said, you're going to have authority over everything in the sky, over all the birds. You're going to have authority over everything in the land. You're going to have authority over every creeping thing, anything that lives on it. You're going to have authority. Because in Genesis chapter 2, God owned it in Genesis chapter 1, but he rented it to man in Genesis chapter 2. He rented it to him. And he says, you're going to have total authority. See, some of you rent a home. If I drove down the street and I looked at your home compared to the home next, I couldn't tell whether you owned it or you rented it. I wouldn't know from looking out. Some of you have rented apartments. Well, when you walk into an apartment complex and you rent something, you rent it for a period of time. And what does that mean? For that period of time, even though you don't own it, it gets to be your home. For that period of time. And God began to rent it to Adam. And he says, you're going to have authority. You're going to have authority. But then God began to think. He said, Adam, 
this is too big a job for a man. It's too much, too much to do, so I'm going to have to create a woman to get the work done. And then what he did was he began and he created Eve. He said, man, I can give you the job, but we got to get the job done, so we're going to bring a woman on this scene. And as a result of that, Adam and Eve. So God created this earth. It belongs to him. In Genesis chapter 2, he leased it to Adam and Eve. It's their home for whatever period of time. It's theirs. But as with every lease, there's a condition. And the particular condition was this. Adam, everything in this world is yours. It's all yours. You have authority over it except one thing. There's one tree. Don't mess with the one tree. Just think of it. Think of all the forest that you can see up in the mountains. Think of all the terrain. Think of all the territory. Think of all the area. And God gives it all to you and he says, there's just one tree. Think of everything you could do in this world and just one tree. And God says, don't mess with it. Don't mess with that. But what did Adam do? He messed with that one tree. That gets you to Genesis 3. Because in Genesis 3, God had leased it to Adam in Genesis 2. But in Genesis 3, he messed with the one tree And what Adam did was he leased this world. He subleased it to the devil. Now, here's the thing. Those of you that may be in business, you walk into a place that has a whole lot of warehouse space and you lease that whole building. But then you find out, hey, you know what? I don't need it all, so I'm going to sublease it. Well, that's what Adam did did. And in Genesis chapter 3, what it begins to talk about is that when he subleased it to the devil, this world was changed. And, and I get it. You know, young people, they fascinate me. Because they say, why would I ever believe in a God who created a world like this? You've never seen the world that God created. You've never lived in the world that God created. You've only lived in the world that was subleased to the devil. You've never lived in a world that was cancer-free. You've never lived in a world that was pollution-free. You've never lived in a world that was death-free. You've never lived. You've never seen the world that God created. Because what happened is God created a man and told him not to do one thing, and he did it, and he subleased it. It's interesting that In Zechariah chapter 5, Zechariah sees a scroll, but he sees it differently. It says in Zechariah chapter 5 and verse 1, Then I turned and lifted up my eyes, and I looked, and behold, a flying scroll. People say, man, that's what I hate about the Bible. You know, it's all this stuff that doesn't make any sense. Imagine if you've never seen a screen on a wall. You've never seen it in your life. You've never seen it. And you see for the first time a screen. And maybe it has words printed on that screen. What would you say it is? The only thing you could think, you've never seen a screen up there. You've never seen it attached to anything. You would say, well, it looks like it's flying. Everyone interprets revelation according to the knowledge they have. He had never seen it. So in the midst of that, he sees it. And he says, man, this scroll, you know what? It's about 15 cubits by 20 cubits. Or it's about 15 feet by 30 feet. It's about the size of that. That's what he's looking at. But as he begins to look, here's what he sees. He says on the back of the scroll... It says, written thereon is the curse that goeth forth over all the earth. Remember in Genesis 2 when God leased this planet? What happens when you lease something? You sign a lease. 
you enter into a legal agreement, a document. See, Adam read the lease. He knew what was going to happen. In fact, what's interesting is, is the Bible says in Timothy that Adam sinned, but the woman was deceived. Do you know why she didn't sin? Was because she wasn't created when the lease was signed. Only Adam was. And so he sinned. But from that day forward, here's how sin gets in the world. It goes from father to child, father to child, father to child, father to child. That's how sin is propagated. Because it was all handed down from Adam. Father to child, father to child, father to child. So in the midst of that, we begin to see, and he sees this curse. In fact, if you study Genesis chapter 3, God says after, after they sublease it, he makes this statement. He says, the curse is coming, and the curse that's coming is this. He says, guys, things that used to be easy are going to be hard. Things that used to be natural are going to be difficult. Things that used to be one way are going to be a different way. And he says, things that used to be pain-free are going to be painful. All because you let the curse come in this world. Let me put it to you in terms you can relate to. Here are the terms. If you're a Christian, this world is as close as you will ever get to hell. But if you're an unbeliever, this world is as close as you will ever get to heaven. So when I turn on the TV and I'm sitting there looking at another school shooting, this is as close as I'm ever getting. But when an unbeliever sees a beautiful sunrise, it's as close to heaven as they're getting. When they see a beautiful sunset, it's as close to heaven as they're ever getting. When they see a mama who's just given birth to a child and she holds it for the first time, they're seeing a glimpse of the purity of heaven. But it's as close to heaven as they're ever going to get. But let's go back to the story. Why is John over there crying? Why is he in tears? Why is he watching this whole scene and he's crying? Because John's seeing into the future. And as he sees into the future, he knows that that curse is on this world and this world can't take anymore. He's looking at it and he said, it just can't take anymore. It can't take anymore. This world cannot take anymore. See, see, here's the thing. The Bible says in Romans, it says in there that sin compounds. It doesn't say sin adds, it multiplies. So you don't get sin plus sin. You get sin to the first power, sin to the second power, sin to the third power, and I don't know where we're at, to the thousandth power, to whatever, but it keeps multiplying. And that's why old people in my church, they'll come to me and they'll say things, Pastor, I wish for the good old days because it used to not be like this. We didn't have all of this when I was growing up. Do you know what? They're talking about a day before sin multiplied. But do you know what the Bible says? There's only one thing that multiplies quicker than sin. It says that where sin doth multiply, grace abounds much more. There's only one thing, and that is the grace of God. Now, here's the thing. This world isn't under grace. The people who believe us. See, this world's under a curse. But when I believe, I'm under grace. So let me give you an illustration. Here's what it looks like. Let's say 
it's one of those rare days in Southern California and it's raining. <laughs> and let's just say you're walking out to the parking lot. Do you know what? You can take your umbrella and you can open it up. And even though there's rain all around you, you're not getting wet. Why? Because you have an umbrella. Well, that umbrella is the grace of God. But let's say someone else is walking to the car and they're getting rained on and you look at them. You know what? You can share your umbrella. But when you shut down churches and Christians decide to stay home, you know what that means? You've taken the grace of God, you folded up your umbrella, you put it in the corner of your house, and you've not left this world to a curse. And we have too many Christians who decided to take their umbrella and fold it up. See, in this world, a curse is here. I know why John's crying. I've held the hands of 17 people when they took their last breath. Now, all those people went to heaven, but the Bible says death is the last enemy. It was never fun. I've seen enough people with cancer. I've stood at their bedsides. I've seen enough addicted teenagers. I've seen enough men that decided it was cool to take a drink, but they didn't realize that drink was going to lead to another drink and another drink. And what happened as a result of it is they destroyed their marriage and their kids don't want to have anything to do with them because they're addicted. I've seen enough pain. If it were left up to me, we'd put a fork in this thing. And we'd call it done. That's what John's crying about. He's saying this world can't take anymore. It can't handle anymore. How much more pain can it handle? How much more sin can it handle? How much is too much before it rips apart? In fact, Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 8 and verse 20. He says this whole world groans under the weight of sin. See, this world says before God, we didn't sin, Adam sinned. We live under the burden of a decision that wasn't ours. And this world's groaning because it says it just can't. It says it's travailing. It, it just can't manage it. It just can't handle it. So you get back to Revelation. Who can open the scroll? That's what the angel's asking. See, the problem with the scroll is it was signed by a perfect man. So the only way that it can be opened is by another perfect man. But sins passed from father to child, father to child. So someone has to be born into this world without a dad. They have to be born of a virgin. It's the only way. So when we celebrate Christmas, we're not celebrating just a nice little thing. We're celebrating the birth of the one person who can take the scroll and make everything right. But let me be honest. Why does it matter that anyone in Rancho Cucamonga knows this? I mean, some of you know more Bible than you used to know. Yay you. Why does it matter? I can't do anything about it. I can't take the scroll. I can't hurry it up. You can't hurry it up. Why does it matter? Why did God put a verse in the Bible, a passage, that tells us a possible outcome? that is beyond our reach to create. So why? Is it just so we have more Bible knowledge? Hey, I've done enough church. I've pastored a long time. Why? I believe there are two reasons that God wants us to know this passage. There are two reasons. 
The first one is God wants us to know that the clock is ticking. Every lease is for a period of time. Every lease has a beginning and an end. And he wants us to know that this world, this world, the clock is ticking. But I think one of the reasons he wants us to know that this world, the clock is ticking, is because he wants you to know that the clock's ticking on you. See, the average person in this room is going to live 28,500 days. When you got up this morning, you marked off one of those days. You're not going to be on. People say, is this the last generation? It's your last generation. You don't get to. Some of you brought out your phone for the first time and you're trying to calculate 28,500 days. Some of you are the over, some of you are the under. It's about 78 years. Some of you are playing with house money. You beat it. Some of you will be the under. I wished I could take you back literally 43 years ago. 43 years ago, I'm a young minister, and I've been asked to speak at a small West Texas church. Now, if you've never been to West Texas, and you've never been into their small communities, their churches are all the same. You walk into a West Texas church, one of their small ones, it's about 70 people. Now, everyone in those churches knows everyone, and they know everything. There are no secret prayer requests. Everyone knows everything about everyone. I had come in early on the Sunday morning because I just wanted to feel for the church. I'm going to speak at their Sunday night service. I'm sitting there. Pastor's preaching. The doors open up. When the doors open up, a young man walks in, sits down in the middle. You could see all the heads of people because they turned. They began to look, and you could tell by how they're looking, no one knows this young man. No one has an idea who he is. But at that time, something happened that I've only seen happen two times in my 45 years of ministry. The fear of God fell in that place. I'm not talking about this sweet thing that we talk about, you know, holy, holy. I'm talking about the tangible fear of God. It was like taking a blanket and throwing it over there. Everyone felt it. It wasn't one person having a moment with God. Everyone in there felt it. It's tangible fear. Pastor, as it began to hit, he, he didn't know what to do with it, so he, he finishes his message and he gives the altar call. Nobody responds. He gives it again. Nobody responds, but everyone can feel the fear of God. Someone says, I don't get the fear of God. You will one day because everyone will stand before Jesus and give an account. And you will be asked two questions. One, were you a person of faith? And if you say yes, then a second one, were you faithful? And so in the middle of that, the fear of God hit. Everyone in there, it's like someone took a blanket and flew it, threw it over the whole place. Pastor gives it the third time. No one responds. He doesn't know what to do. He closes the service. But everybody's talking about it. Did you feel that? Did you feel that? The next day, the pastor and I are in his office Small West Texas town, the siren goes off. They don't have a fire department. They have a volunteer fire department. It means that all the volunteers get to a certain location. They take off to wherever the problem is. What we knew was that there was a problem. We didn't know what it was or where it was. We're just having a conversation. About an hour after the sirens had gone off, someone comes to the door of the church, and 
the pastor meets them and they said, well, did you hear? And said, well, we'd just been in my office talking. And they said, well, there was a young man and he was a crop duster that he would go and crop, you know, dust the crops around West Texas. And he was in his plane and around the edge of the fields in West Texas, they plant trees, which are the tree lines to stop the wind from blowing away all the good soil. And they said that as he was reaching the edge of it, he began to pull up, but his plane stalled, he ran into one of the trees that exploded and he died. We began to talk further with that individual and with others that began to come and we realized it was the young man that had been in the church service the day before. See, that day the clock was ticking. He wasn't going to get the over, he was going to get the under. And God was doing everything that he could to get his attention. He was doing everything he could. Why? Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, according to Proverbs. And he was doing everything he could. Someone said, well, what happened? What, what if he didn't make a decision? There's only two locations after this life. There's either heaven or there's a hell. And people sometimes, especially Christians, they get a little bit finicky about that hell word. But here's the thing. Hell is God giving people what they want. See, if you don't want a little bit of Jesus down here, why would you want a lot of Jesus up there? Why would you, if you don't want a little bit of, well, you know, I don't want that name. I don't want that. I don't want this and everything. If you don't, do you understand that heaven is about a lot of Jesus? You're not going to heaven without a lot. And let me help some of the rest of you. Some of you say, well, I want to go to heaven to see my family. Heaven's not about seeing your family. It's about seeing Jesus. But I think everyone in this room, God wants us to know that the clock ticks. It's going. Every day. Every day it ticks. I think the second thing he wants us to know is that there's a way you have to live while the clock on this world is ticking. In the book of Jude, it's just one chapter in verse 20, it says this. Now, the book of Jude was written about the end times. That was the whole subject matter of it. And it says in verse 20, it says, Beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, what did Jesus say the first thing would happen is the end of this world would begin to occur? Problems would go up and faith would go where? Down. Jude's answering the questions, when problems get bigger, how do you keep yourself in faith? He says, what you do is you pray in the Holy Spirit. And see, some of you, you have faith in Jesus, that gets you in heaven. But receiving the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to live strong down here. But then it doesn't stop there. It then goes on and it says this, and keeping yourself in the love of God. Now, what did he say? The second thing that would happen, anger goes up and love goes down. Jude was saying, if you want to be a person who stays in faith and walks in love, when this world is falling apart, then you need to be filled with the Spirit and you need to be a person who's utilizing that in your life. And what I found in ministry is that people who have faith and people who have love never lack for hope. So, Revelation, the clock's ticking. Every day I watch people 
who want to ignore the clock. It's ticking. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today that you would begin to speak to people. Lord, I don't know where people are. I don't know what's going on in their lives. But I do know what's going on in this world. And I pray right now that you would just minister. See, I don't know the person who's content with this world being as close to heaven as they'll ever get. And I don't know the Christian who thinks that their faith will always be strong, but you do. And I pray, Father, that you would do what's bigger than me. I can share a truth. You're the only one that can create transformation. Today, create transformation in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Three questions. First of all, do you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I'm not asking if you're a member of a church, my church, this church. Do you have a relationship? Not asking if you've been through confirmation, dedication, water baptism. You've been christened. Do you have a relationship? Do you know that if you were to die today, that you would be right with God and go to heaven? If you don't know that, I want to pray with you. Second question. Maybe you would say, hey, I'm a person of faith. But as a person of faith, I'm just not close to him. I know I believe in him, but I'm not close to him. Jesus doesn't come into your life to be a part of your life. Jesus comes into your life to be the sinner. And if he's not, today's the day. But the third question, if you are a person of faith and you're close to him, have you ever been filled with the spirit where you can build yourself up in your most holy faith? Pray in the spirit. If you haven't, I want to pray for you. So our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In any one of those three areas, you know that I'm talking to you. I want to pray with you. If you'd like to be a part of that prayer, if you'll just raise your hand wherever you're at right now. I see that hand. 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 I'm going to need your help because I just can't see as well as I used to. If you raised your hand and you want to be prayed for, I'm going to ask you to stand wherever you're at and to come down here. If you'll just stand and you'll come down here. Someone says, well, what will people think? One day you're not going to stand before your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister. You're going to stand before Jesus and give an account. And he's the only one that matters. And if you'll stand down here, it'll be easy to stand up there. So I need you to come down here. If you'll just come down. Now's the time. You come down here. If all of you that are down here will look at me. Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so much. He cares for you so deeply. What we're about to do is we're going to pray a prayer that's going to do one of three things. If you don't know him, you'll get to know him. If you know him and you're not close to him, you're going to get close to him. But if you know him and you're close to him and you want to be filled with the Spirit, you're going to get filled with the Spirit. But let me say to all of you that are out there, church isn't a spectator sport. You're either receiving in faith or helping others receive in faith. So right now, whether you're out there or you're up here, I need you to lift your hands towards God 
and we're going to help them with our faith. Everyone repeat after me. Heavenly Father, you said in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Today I'm doing that. I believe with all my heart that you are my Lord. Therefore, I thank you for saving me and changing my life forever in Jesus' name. And today, Lord, I'm asking you to fill me with the Holy Spirit and to give me my heavenly prayer language. And I believe today that when hands are laid on me, I will instantly receive my heavenly prayer language. I believe that when hands are laid on me, I will instantly receive my heavenly prayer language in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This young lady is going to tell you where to go next, but here's what I want to say to you. Don't leave if you came to be filled with the Spirit without having someone lay hands on you. Can we thank Pastor Gerald Brooks? And can we just give it up for everybody who just gave their life to Jesus? This is one of the best decisions that you guys could ever make. Just a few things before our prayer team comes up. And if you do want to be filled with the Spirit, our prayer team would love to pray and lay hands over you. But if you said yes to Jesus, your best next step to take is head to this, Grow.Faith. Pastor Diego, we combined two of his books, put it into one. It's completely free, and we urge you to download it. And we want to issue you a 12-month challenge. As much as you can for the next 12 months, get to church. Your faith, your hope, and your love grows when you're surrounded by a body of believers. Amen? Hey, um, my mind was blown after this message. Like, I feel like I need to reread my whole Bible over again. Um, so, so if you enjoy that, be sure to stop by the bookstore. Uh, go ahead and purchase Pastor Gerald Brooks, uh, his book. We have them available, and if we run out, we'll have some on Sunday. Again, our prayer team will be available in the front for if you want to receive the Holy Spirit. Will you guys uh, stretch your hands forth as we close out this service? God, we thank you for this message that went forth. We thank you for our leadership. We thank you for our board members who can come and pour into us your word and teach us things that we didn't know. And we pray that as people get their hands laid on by our prayer team, that, that we experience your tangible presence, that people are filled with your spirit, God, tangibly externally would we see it we love you may this not stop here will we carry this back home to our families to our workplace we love you we give you all the praise glory and honor in jesus name amen we love you church we'll see you next week